people who don't who don't put their cameras on, who don't realize the great benefits. Yes, the recording has started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to today's exciting Center for Educational Neuroscience seminar. My name is Yasin Arslan, and I'm a PhD candidate at UCL Institute of Education. Before I introduce our speaker, Tracy Tokama Espinoza, I would like to quickly share that the International Mind, Brain and Education Societies Conference will take place in Belgium this July. This is an education neuroscience conference designed for both researchers and educators. You can see some important details on the screen now, including some important deadlines. And further details can be found at the conference website invest2024.org. So without taking too much of our speaker's time, it's my pleasure to introduce Tracy Tokohama Espinoza, whose work I've been following with great interest. Tracy teaches at Harvard College and the Harvard University Extension School, focusing on the neuroscience of learning. Her research integrates mind, brain, and education science into teachers' daily practice and professional development. She also explores curriculum changes to enhance early math and preliteracy skills, bilingualism, multilingualism, and the use of technology to improve learning outcomes. Tracy is the co-founder of Conexiones, I hope I spelled it correctly, which is a learning sciences platform. She is also an associate editor of the Nature Partner Science of Learning Journal and a former member of the OECD expert panel to redefine teachers' new pedagogical knowledge. She is the author of several books and articles aiming to improve teaching, expand transdisciplinary research, and help students and teachers better understand their own brains. Coordinating numerous international research projects, Tracy currently facilitates workshops for thousands of teachers each year. In this session, Tracy will be talking to us about teacher development in mind, brain, and education, and how teachers can become learning scientists. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and we will get back to them after the chat. So I will hand over to you, Tracy. Thank you so much for that very, very beautiful introduction, Yasim. And thank you, Michael, for organizing this and always running these fantastic um sessions, I really am honored uh, to participate and to be here. And I also saw some, um, I see some names, I don't see enough faces. I know that my, my current students, uh, David and some friends who know me very well know how much I love to see your faces. So if you do have cameras, do turn them on. It's always a, a joy for me to get that kind of feedback here. But um, thank you, Victoria. And it's so great to see Vicky, who is from the Science of Learning Journal. If any of you have questions related to uh, the Nature Partner Journal Science of Learning. Um, she's also here as well. So thank you for that introduction. Today, um, I just want to look at this broader category of mind-brain education or mind-brain health and education and just you know talk about the elephant in the room. <laughs> Everybody says, well, this is just obvious. This is such great information. Transdisciplinarity is the way to go. How come it hasn't made its way into more teacher education programs? And this is the big question that's going on. And so I'd like to just offer a little bit of background, um, tell you where I have seen or witnessed this field sort of evolve from, from the beginning. And uh, my own personal theory about what's slowing up um, the uptake of all this great information and maybe what we can do about that. And um, hopefully all of you will embrace this idea that it is um, on us really to really move this field forward. So. I really appreciate um, your generous introduction, Nassim. I do work at, um, I'll be teaching at the Harvard Summer School this summer, at my course on the neuroscience of learning. It's an introduction to mind brain health and education. So we've integrated this element of mental and physical health and well being into the idea of mind brain education as well. Um, and if you are interested, I have uh, two great books coming out. One is on questions kids ask about their own brains, which was a year long study in 21 countries, just answering questions that kids had about their own brains. And writing thinking in the brain is also coming out. Um, these are some different, uh, some newer research that I've been working on, which I'm happy to discuss afterwards. Um, but uh, I would like to invite you to, to have a look and dig, dig, dig deeper into the information that does exist right now in this field of mind, brain, and education. 
So for anybody who likes to follow along with slides, you can go ahead and use the QR code. And I've made a folder for this presentation. The slide deck is there. And also um, some of the handouts that I'm going to mention are also in that folder. So you can go ahead and, and use that. And if you don't catch it right now, I'll be sure to um, repeat this at the very, very end. But the very short answer, for those of you who are busy people and you're going to run off, I just want to know the answer. Why hasn't MindBrain Education made its way into more teacher training programs? Here's your really short answer. Um, time, it hasn't existed long enough. The complexity of the field, uh, general consensus about what it's out to do and the main principles, and, and a question of leadership. And I'll dig a little bit deeper into each of those elements right now. Time is from two different perspectives. One is that we've always considered mind, brain, health, and education throughout history. And if you're interested in a beautiful timeline that um, I was lucky enough to have input um, from many, many great scholars, David Daniel, Mary Helen, Mardino Yang, Howard Gardner, people, you know, where did this field come from? There's a long list of key publications, findings, discoveries about the brain throughout history over the past, you know, 2,500 years, which actually makes it clear that getting to today we're actually pretty fast. You know, it's been 20 years, but but maybe relative to everything, you know, we're not taking that long to develop an entirely new field. So that's one thing. I just want people to sort of, uh, you know, don't worry. We're not hitting on the brakes. It's just that things do take time, and to establish um, new fields is actually really very a very challenging thing, especially in a transdisciplinary nature. But time also is sped up when you have certain criteria. And in one sense, um, fields definitely require, and this is something that uh, Mark Schwartz pointed out to me when we were doing the first International Delphi panel to try to establish, is this a new field? Is this a new area of study? He said, well, uh, does it have research goals? Does it have practice goals? And are there policy goals in place? And in 2007, eight, during the first International Delphi panel I did, if you would like to see those, those goals there, they're on this QR code, um, but that's also in the folder. Um, it basically, there it it's true, they do exist. And there was actually a consensus, but it was unspoken until we articulated them in um, 2008. We said, well, do we agree that some of the research goals should be X, that some of the practice goals should be Y, that policy goals should be Z? And there was a general consensus of that panel, which was, you know, a good head start. It doesn't mean everybody knows that they exist and that everybody abides by them, but at least it gave us a starting point to debate, you know, where should this field really be? But then he also said, and 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 um, Howard Gardner pointed this out, you, you can't move a field forward if you don't have a society of people, if you don't have a conference going on, and if you don't have a journal, but if you have a society, a conference and a journal, you've basically got a field, which I thought was a pretty interesting and clean way to do it. And one of the things that I don't think any of them anticipated was the importance of certain universities like UCL and, and Baerbeck and you, you folks actually organizing, expanding in a, a society, basically saying that it doesn't have to be at conference meetings that we meet, we can meet every week <laughs> and have these kinds of encounters and exchanges. And so that has expanded and accelerated really uh, the field. So the question then is if we meet all these criteria of what it takes to create a field, how come this hasn't moved forward any better? Why aren't these things known? And principally it's because of the complexity. Um, mind brain education or mind brain health and education is an international society. It is transdisciplinary in nature. It is. Uh, it looks at humans at, at multi levels. It's not just neurons or kids in classrooms, uh, you know, from a psychological perspective. But it's how entire classrooms or groups of people are socially contagious with each other, and it's done at an internationally comparative scale. Um, and that means it all requires translational science. It requires at least some of us to be good at all those languages at understanding neuroscientific jargon, psychology, mental health and well-being, education, and being able to communicate. And one of the things that's been so beautiful is I think if you look at the list of speakers that have come to this particular series, that's actually kind of like a, a, a rock star list of some of the people. I, I don't, I feel, this is why I feel so honored to be in this group of people who actually are very good at translational science. And it's not common. And it is a skill set. And that is something that's slowly working its way into, um, into this field. 
And this goes into, extends into an, an additional level of understanding. Translation means that when somebody in psychology is talking about growth mindsets, they go back and look at the literature and realize Carol Dweck was totally fascinated with the concept of neuroplasticity. And it was born of an idea, and it's cross-pollinated in her mind, right? But how do we help people understand that this terminology is pretty much the same? And that's something that still remains a challenge. When we talk about transdisciplinary nature of the field, individual disciplines, neuroscience, psychology, education, mental health and well-being work well together. Sometimes they pair to do different types of research together. And there may even be classes in which you have neuropsychology or educational neuroscience, but you don't have this huge mix that habituates an approach to problems using a transdisciplinary perspective. Transdisciplinary thinking is a little bit different. And I would, I would just argue that it's actually more complete because if you are able to approach a problem, uh, why don't, you know, how do Down syndrome kids learn how to do math? Or why don't uh, kids uh, read for pleasure? Or any of these questions we might ask, um, you're gonna get a much better answer when you have a transdisciplinary approach and multiple sources of literature and expertise as opposed to just through a unidisciplinary approach to things. That's my personal uh, preference there. So this little niche space of mind, brain, and education, um, we've expanded a bit because um, initially when I presented this as a poster session at the very first IMBIS conference in 2007, I presented a poster, a very colorful one that had these three Venn diagrams and um, David Daniel walked up to me and he says, well, how is that any different from what we already know? And I said, because this niche space here cares about how we teach. Everybody else historically has been trying to figure out how we learn. This space is trying to figure out how do you take advantage of that to teach better? And then he said, okay, okay. So this is a legitimate uh, perspective to take. This is different. And when I try to say, you know, this is why I love the consensus that was reached in the first Delphi panel, that they wanted the name of the field to be mind, comma, brain, comma, and education, because they wanted an equal playing field of conceptual understanding. When you say cognitive neuroscience, when you say educational neuroscience, education is a subfield of neuroscience. When you say neuroeducation, neuro, neuroscience is a subfield of education. But when you have an even playing field, you're actually seeking out information from all of those different types of formations at an equal level. And that was kind of different. That was different from being um, the traditional um, fields that we had where we had a subfield. Um, and that has been, existed for a long time. But having this very strange field with three names and commas caused a very slow uptake. You had very, very few people saying, oh, I'm a mind brain education scientist. <laughs> Everybody would love to say they're an educational neuroscientist or a neuropsychologist, but nobody wants to say I'm a mind brain education scientist. It was just too much of a mouthful. Um, so in our course, which does, looks at mind brain health and education, we're looking at this you know, very fine intersection that includes all of these distinct perspectives, but also their crossover areas in two or three different planes. And this is something that our students learn to do through a, a very difficult transdisciplinary research project where they're having to seek out literature from multiple perspectives on different types of questions and problems. And this is, speaks to the greater learning sciences. There's a lot more out there than just you know, neuroscience, psychology, and education. And these days, we are really, really embracing the idea of the broader learning sciences, which include things like um, AI and cultural neuroscience or anthropology or linguistics or these other areas. So the greater learning sciences are definitely um, something that I would say that's a movement. There is there is a growth in that direction. The global um, the uh, global uh, learning science. Uh, well, uh, what is Gisolan? Tell me, break that down for me. I can't remember Gisolan again. But there's a movement to try to get unification of networks. It's a network of networks within the learning sciences trying to speak to all all of each other, trying to nurture our understanding about human learning and how to teach better through all of these distinct learning sciences, okay? So this begs the question of where do we get good information in the field? And initially the question was, do you just take all of the criteria and standards from psychology and neuroscience and education and the sum of them is what we do? Or are you only looking for information at the intersection? 
of what goes on. And that created a lot of difficulty in the first decade of mind brain education. But um, nowadays we have different perspectives and I would really uh, love to recommend this, um, this book that came out last year, um, uh, looking at the new science of learning that um, Saleh and, and, and Kain did, uh, in which I have a chapter, um, which you can get information from here. But this looked at a new science of teaching and where the information comes from. And this did stem from a conversation I had with um, David Daniel about, he said, well, everybody's talking about science of learning, learning, learning. We have to talk about teaching and where are we getting our information from? And in that chapter, I summarize where, where I think we've, we might have slowed our own process. Initially, the only thing we were looking for, and this is John Brewer's work, who to me is uh, an amazing mentor. He has kept everybody in check by saying, you know, don't go overboard on the promises of neuroscience to education. But he, the perspective there was that we had to find one-to-one -one near transfer studies. Whereas I am proposing that information that we can use as teachers also come from equivalency studies, untransferred studies, from complex design studies, far transfer studies, and for attitudinal and adaptational studies. This means we're not just looking at something like, you know, neuroscience confirms that interleaving is a good practice, but we can also look more broadly at these other sources of information, which also tell us things when we're calling something growth mindsets and we, but, uh, and somebody else is talking about neuroplasticity or self-motivation. If we look at these equivalencies, there's a lot of great information supporting these different elements, but we've just been using different terminology, right? Untransferred studies are things that we actually know are great for learning, for example, Mind-wandering studies, there's a great uh, wealth of information now looking at how this is this catalyst for creativity, you know, just letting it go for a minute so that things uh, connect with each other. I mean, looking at mind-wandering is absolutely fascinating for creative insight, but we just don't recommend that in schools, Like right? Teachers don't just say, hey, kids, okay, now it's time to mind-wander. It doesn't seem like a natural thing to do, right? So some of these things simply haven't made it. Uh, to the classroom, even though you can have a lot of evidence in neuroscience for them, right? Complex design studies, we know that things like universal design for learning or flipping the classroom or differentiating the things, these are these all are fantastic when they are done correctly, but they're horrible if they're incomplete. Classes that are halfway or partially flipped, for example, you guys, half of you wouldn't survive in my class because you have to have your cameras on and you have to watch the video beforehand and come with questions already prepared. Flipping is amazing when it's done correctly, but it's not amazing when you're not doing all the different elements of it. So the complex designs are not are great for telling us what is needed for an education, but we don't execute them and they're very, very hard to um, replicate because good design studies are very, very hard to come by. Far transfer has to do with things that you have a great deal of evidence, maybe in education and psychology, but you have not tested them in neuroscience. And attitudinal things have to do with things you could change today, but a lot of teachers haven't adapted to them. For example, we know that um, teacher communication predictability, knowing when and where to expect what from whom and where do I stick my stuff, you know, good instructional design, all those things are pretty basic, but sometimes they're not leveraged in the design of course room instruction by teachers. And so basically I, I suggest in this chapter that there's a greater amount of information through which we can actually build this new field a little bit stronger um, than we have in the past. It's not just direct transfer studies that come from neuroscience to education, okay? And this means that we also have to look at the evidence that's coming at these very distinct levels of, of information. And this is a hard thing to come by because it's very difficult in education programs. In neuroscience, they're definitely looking at the molecular level and talking about synaptic construction and the difference between phenotype and, and epigenetics and all the rest of it. But in other typical education classes, we're looking at, I'm sorry, in psychology, you're looking at how that one mind is really functioning. But in education, you're looking at how groups of people learn together, right? Which is very different from doing international comparative studies. And so because of these multiple levels of analysis, it's also slowed the natural growth of this, um, of this field because a lot of people are just working and staying in their lane. They're not cross-pollinating information it comes from different levels of, of analysis, okay? Um, one of the recommendations that we made in this OECD panel in 2017 with um, 
with uh, Kunik and Ansari and um, several others was to look at um, the missing or the typical gaps that you might find in teacher education formation. And the two big red flags were, of course, technology and neuroscience. They don't know enough about how the brain really learns and teachers aren't getting enough information about how to leverage technology so that they can do the things that are more personal with students. And so these things were missing in the literature. And this sort of leads to what I like to call it, you know, a typical, here's a simple model of what we really should be doing. We should, you, teachers need to know their stuff. If you're gonna be a math teacher, you should know math, right? So you have to have content knowledge, but you also need to know how to teach that. And you also need to know how to leverage technology and you also need to know about the brain. If you can put all that into your context, into cultural context, then you have the teacher as a learning scientist. And this is not as straightforward or as clean as a lot of typical education curricula, right? And so this is why it is a complex thing to take into consideration, all right? So for those of you who are saying, okay, but who is anybody really doing anything out there? I actually had this challenge from a couple of teachers who I met at Imbus uh, several years before who were saying, okay, I'm moving the ground. My whole school is moving towards a mind-brain education perspective. We are going in this direction. And I've had students tell me this from all over the world. And the, one of them was my TA last year, um, Kristen Simmers, who's now working with Ido de Vadesco, who left teaching and went into neurosciences, doing all these studies with wearables and trying to see kids in classrooms. But her main focus is who is already doing this and what are they doing? And so when I got that question, and people asked, if I could just, if I could just make the whole school read just, you know, 10 books or 10 things, what would you have them read that would get them jazzed about this whole idea and the benefits of looking at things through this transdisciplinary perspective? Who is actually working as a translate translational communicator in this scientific area? And so I made a list of 101 books and papers that I thought everybody should know. <laughs> this would be great. Then I sent it out to all my friends. And I said, hey, Michael, what do you think? What, what should we add? What should we take away? And nobody took away anything, which tells me something about this humbleness of the field. Nobody wants to slam anybody else, but they definitely added a lot of things. And so I went from 10 to 50 to 100, and there's about 101 different recommended sources. But there is great information out there. There are people doing really good things. There are a lot of you know wonderful titles of people actually doing translational science that should be read by teachers, but we haven't really agreed on, on how to go about doing that and what kind of curricular structures we should do that in. But these are inspirational works. Um, you'll see Michael's book over here, a couple of my books over here. I, 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 I'm not out to do self-promoting, but I do really think that um, it's hard to work as a translational person between fields. And I think that there's only a handful of people who are doing that well. Michael is definitely one of them. So the third point that slowed down our progress in the field has to do with a general consensus. Everybody seems to be reinventing the wheel all the time. So we have an incredibly beautiful but intellectually humble group of people in Imbus. Uh, people, it's like, no, you go, no, you go. <laughs> Everybody, nobody wants to step on anybody else's toes, which is really, really interesting, right? This is like, you can't see this up close, but it says Canadian lemmings. It's like, no, after you, after you, after you. Everybody's like, oh no, it's okay, you can do it first. No, no, you try it. Everybody's so nice that it's very hard to move forward <laughs> because of that, right? And it's a bigger group and the bigger it gets, the harder it is to come to consensus about what the quality information is. And when I tried to do my International Delphi panels in 2007-8, in 2017, in 2020, when we tried to grow this information um, as a base, the larger the group, the harder it got, which is this idea of too many cooks in the kitchen. This says, after incorporating everyone's feedback, our special tonight will be a dish of plain hot water. <laughs> So basically you boil down to the things that everybody already knew and agreed and nobody is sort of on the cutting edge of things, which is a real uh, sad thing, right? Um, I think that, you know, if you just have one person, if each of you decides I'm going to be a learning scientist, I am going to go out there, I am going to read these books, change the world, incorporate these things in a new practice, that can happen tomorrow, right? But if you are trying to get a group of people to decide on something or a community or your entire school or to get a city or even countries 
or whole societies to get together. It's a very, very slow process. Uh, my husband is a ambassador of Ecuador to the United Nations. I cannot tell you a more slow moving machine. Consensus at this macro level is incredibly slow. And I do see a parallel with what's going on in mind and education. So in the st studies that I had tried to do looking at um, what do we really know and can we share with teachers? What was very interesting to me is that over the many years, um, we've increased the number of experts that were included in our panels and the number of countries, you know, trying not to be very Eurocentric or America centric uh, and increased a lot of the literature. But guess what? The good information has not changed. There's only six things that people say, oh, we all agree on this. You know, there's neuroplast neuroplasticity exists in the brain. All new learning passes the filter of prior experience. There's only a handful of things that people all agree on. And that actually hasn't changed at all. What is kind of scary is that in my first Delphi panel, um, when I looked at myths, um, myths have actually, you know, doubled, almost tripled in numbers. So this is a scary thing, is that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, knowing just a teeny bit about the brain has led a lot of people to self-label as experts and, and come out with some kind of crazy stuff that's not, um, that's not real. And so we have to get rid of and we have to fight these um, neuromythical understandings that are coming out. Based on that, um, in one of the recent studies that we did, we, we gave... Um, in this was uh, 2023, we summarized what it was that happened in that very last in the 2020 survey and what it was that, you know, 112 experts were saying, you know, this is good stuff to share with teachers. And it's only a handful of things. They haven't changed very much. The last point, and then I'll open things up for questions, is that um, when mind brain education was first born, <laughs> It was really criticized as being, oh, this is way too Harvard. This is just a degree from Harvard because Kurt Fisher and Howard Gardner were from Harvard and everybody thought, okay, that's just, it's just degree, it's not a field. Um, and then it, Imbus is like any other organization, like what you guys are doing here, which is why I thank you so much, um, Stella and Yasin for pulling this together. It relies on volunteers to make things work. It relies on good people pulling it together, donating from their own energy and time. Nobody pays you to be the president of IMBIS, and that's a real problem. Nobody pays you to be, you know, head of the graduate studies in IMBIS or any of these other organizations, which means that, you know, the early um, SIG that's, that's dedicated to this as well is really based on good will, volunteers, people who are willing to give their time to move a group forward. And it's nobody's first priority. <laughs> So this has been part of the reason it's been a very slow move towards establishing the field. The natural, I guess the last point is that the natural leaders have already served. Uh, people like Mary Helene Mordenio Yang um, and Kurt Fisher, all these guys have already been, you know, presidents and they've, they, they've moved on to other things. And, and so it's very hard. Now you're looking at a whole new up and coming group of people, but all of them are also so nice and not stepping on anybody's toes that to be, I guess, this is a super American thing to say, but I think everybody can be a leader. <laughs> you don't have to wait for somebody else to lead. I do think we could all take some leadership roles and, and step it up a, a bit and actually step into more roles um, in this way to move the field forward, okay? Um, the final point, and this was something that uh, came very obvious um, after the second Delphi panel, after everybody had said that they want to call this mind, brain, and education, then, and they said it's a science, so it should be called mind, brain, education, science. And I said, okay, so you are all mind, brain, education scientists. None of them, none of them call themselves that. Everybody calls himself an educational psychologist, a cognitive neuroscientist, an affective neuroscientist, but nobody calls themselves, they don't give themselves a label. So this is why it's another reason that it's very hard to, to know what we're talking about. So what would be the solutions? I'm just going to give you a handful of ideas and you guys can just decide uh, if this is too idealistic or not. Um, it's taking time, but we can either just let it go at its own pace because actually it's not that slow, or we can actually speed it up by each of us embracing certain principles and tenets that are agreed upon by at least a, a large majority of the people who are working in the field. Related to complexity, you know, 
the brain, we're talking about the brain here. It's the most complex organism in the entire universe. It's okay, embrace it. You know, I think that we're getting better evidence through this transdisciplinary thinking. It's harder and it's harder for students to get used to that way of thinking, but it will yield better findings. Um, to get consensus, we can, I think that we have enough core elements. What is bad information? What are myths? That's pretty clear. There's only a handful of things, six things that everybody says, okay, these are true. These, these can be principles or guiding principles. Um, and tenants are things that I have labeled are true. There's no truth in science. There's just evidence or no evidence, but they, there's a lot of evidence that they influence learning outcomes, but there's a huge range of human variability. For example, uh, motivation. Do you think motivation is important for learning? Obviously, but what motivates, you know, Victoria does not motivate Lisa. So motivation has variability. Um, sleep, sleep and dreaming, do they have an influence on learning? Absolutely. But nobody can dictate how many hours of sleep you need, right? So we know that these things are true, they have evidence, but unless you really know your students and understand that human variability, it's very hard to apply those things. So we know that those tenants are also valuable, but they're very hard to apply unless you know their students well. Finally, in terms of leadership, I just say, we can all be leaders and I think we should all sort of step it up and be out there and decide, you know, I am a learning scientist. You can just sort of own that as a, another kind of identity that we should all have at this stage of the game. Okay. So what would it be like, you know, would it make a difference? Uh, I definitely think first steps here, we have to get rid of those myths, make sure that that is, we clear the decks and it is stunning. And Michael, you can tell me if I'm, I'm wrong about this or not. But in 2000, 2005, 2010, myths for everything that was a myth buster, there was a new myth, a new myth, a new myth, a new myth. These days, there is like a 10 to 1 margin of articles about neuromythical thinking, criticizing neuromyth, and people understand it, they get it now, as opposed to people promoting myths. And so we're finally turning the corner on neuromyths, which I think is really great. In terms of principle, whoops. Then after we get rid of the myths, and this was a recommendation um, that basically <laughs> when I was in a neuroscience conference with Daniel Ansari and Shashank Varma, uh, neuroscientist, psychologist, education, we were trying to come up with a glossary of terms. What could we use for mind-brain education? And I said, if we have the vocabulary, we'll be able to talk to each other. And uh, it was very clear. Daniel said, no, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the myths. If we can get rid of the myths, then we could start to share the good information. Because if you still even believe halfway in these myths, you can never, you can't apply these principles or tenets. If you still think that men's and women's brains have these, you know, significant differences or people are only using 10% of their brain or their right or left brain, if they believe anything mythical here, it's very hard to get to this information. So get rid of the myths, then teach the good stuff, okay? then put that into context. It needs to be in context. Then, and only then, could you then have instructional guidelines that we could propose for my brain education, okay? So clear the decks, get rid of neuromyths. Um, if you want to see why neuromyths still exist, there's a QR code that has a, a list of the summary of the literature of why, why they do exist <laughs> still. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all of these different myths, sorry. It's just, uh, it's one of my pet peeves. Then principles, what are the few things that we know are true about all human brains, independent of culture, generally independent of age, um, neuroplasticity exists, right? And can we share those good concepts with people? Um, and the principles are just listed here. If you wanted to, um, I'll share a QR code right after this, that shares a, a video that summarizes each of these different um, core principles that was agreed upon in the last Delphi study which is this one right here. If you wanna watch an explanation of each of these six principles and the evidence that's behind them, you can go ahead and, and look at them here. And then the 21 tenants, the things that are true, but there's a huge range of human variability. For example, uh, what stresses one person doesn't stress another, what triggers depression in other people, uh, whether or not uh, learning can have any level of unconsciousness to it, um, how people, are affected by you know, tones of voices or facial expressions as far as emotions are concerned. Uh, all of these things influence learning outcomes. However, they 
vary by individual. So the huge range of human variability has to be taken into consideration before people can actually leverage that. And if you'd like to see a video on each one of those 21 things sort of broken down a little bit more calmly, because I do speak very fast. My students always say they love me more in video than they do in real life because they can slow me down. David told me he has to listen to me at half speed before he understands <laughs> what, what I said in the pre-class video. But go ahead and have a look at those videos if it's of interest. I'm just gonna leave with just this sobering thought. I am one of the most optimistic people in the world about the benefits of this beautiful transdisciplinary field that we are in. But we are taking baby steps. We, we know so little really about how the brain really learns. And, and, but we can leverage what we do know, but we should always, always, always be very open to new and upcoming evidence and to modify our practices based on, on those elements. And so I do want to you know, tamper my enthusiasm with this reality check that there is so much we just don't know right now and it's okay. Um, but it's so exciting because we are riding the wave. We are a part of all this, aren't we? We are just getting to this new stage of an understanding of a science of teaching where we haven't been before um, ever in the history of, of education. And so um, I, I would like to say congratulations to you guys for being a part of all of this, especially those young PhDs out there who so enthusiastically say, oh, are you, are you sure you can come? This would really be fun. I was like, yeah, this is great. I love, I love um, seeing that fire that you guys have that's really going to answer so many of these other questions and help be the communicators that we really need. So what did I try to do? I want to give you a background. Mind, brain, health, and education has sort of come from this long natural history, but we're naturally evolving into this new space that can inform better teaching interventions. So this evolution only over the past 20 years of its existence shouldn't be lamented. It's been slow, but you know what? Fields take a long time to develop. And so relatively speaking in your lifetime, you guys are thinking it's taken forever. How come this hasn't got hold? It's going fast and it will go faster if, with your help. So long as you guys start leaning into this as well, okay? I think that we've been slowed down because we haven't communicated well enough. We all haven't embraced this idea of being leaders. And the complexity of transdisciplinary thinking has slowed us a bit, but it is something that can be actually beneficial in the long run. Um, so now I will stop and would love to hear, have a dialogue with you guys about what you think. Am I being overly optimistic about these things or do you think um, there is some, some hope here for this field? If you would like, I always ask at the end that people try to consolidate their knowledge. You drop in on these webinars for an hour and you're listening and you're cooking, and you're doing something else. You think this is really interesting. If you do not stop to take the time to reflect a minute and ask yourself, did I really learn anything new? <laughs> Am I now curious about something? Will I change anything I actually do? If you don't stop and do that after every single webinar you attend, you're not making the most of your time. You know, we had a good time, but it's not going to change anything. I, I, I like to make a difference. So I would invite you to do this reflection. And if you are so inclined, send it to me because if there's two things you'd like to continue to research or you're curious about and then we didn't have enough time to go into detail, I will send it to you. I will send you resources. And you're, uh, you've seen that we did not put the bundles here. I'm gonna put um, a link to what I call bundles, which are curated reading lists in about 70 different categories from ranging from memory to math to everything, uh, attention, differentiation, affect. They are the bundles that we use for my class at Harvard instead of readings. The students get to choose their homework. So they're about the top 100 articles in a certain area, um, and they choose what they do. I will be sharing that link uh, to the bundles in the chat in just a second. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to look for the bundles. And then, Yasim, I'm listening. Uh, to, my ears are perked. We agreed not to have any preset questions. So I want to see what, what's bubbling to the surface for you. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk, Tracy. I actually enjoyed every second of it, and I have burning questions. So as the chair, I will. I just want to take the pleasure to ask the first question, and we will also have many questions in the chat. So um, my question is about being a learning scientist, actually, uh, Tracy. So we have advanced in the field, especially uh, due to the technological developments in neuroimaging. But, you know, as you mentioned, the evidence changes. 
So what uh, we have found today may be proven invalid tomorrow. So as the further research is conducted, how do you think teachers can be equipped with this or can be aware of this change? That's a great question. And one of the main things I wanted to, I will return to um, is on the presentation I mentioned to you over the course, and I think I went too fast because I, I didn't get to share any details, but over the course of the years, what I found absolutely fascinating is that what we accept as good information, the very few things we accept as good have not changed. They have not changed, which it means and there's only more and more evidence to support them. Um, similarly, the things that are tenants have not changed that much either, which is really interesting. So the good information is getting re, 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 re confirmed. But the bad information, that's the problem, is that people are making up all kinds of crazy now. And so there, so we have to be aware of what people, you know, claims without evidence. But the things that we share, those six principles or 21 tenants, have tons of evidence. And we actually have bundles for each one of the principles and each one of the tenants to show the evidence that's behind all of those. Or Because we didn't generate it, I have to explain. My Delphi was weird. The Delphi not only asks, do you agree or not agree? It says, what evidence do you have for what you think? So, peep, so the participants sent articles, they sent information to support what they thought. For example, does neuroplasticity exist? Yes, not only does it exist, it exists in children. And here are the 50 studies I have of uh, neuroplastic studies in children. So they would send us evidence to support their opinions. And then when I went back in the Delphi, I would say, this is the consensus or whatever, and this is the evidence that's been shared. Does anybody want to refute this? And so there was a back and forth trying to come to a negotiation of what is really uh, true or not. And so the main thing is that the good stuff is is going to be good. I have a feeling it has not budged very much in 15 years, which is it's just gotten stronger. But the bad stuff, there are more and more myths out there, which are very, very disturbing. So we do have to keep our, our, our eyes out for that. But as you say, staying up to date is key, which is why my class, sorry, doesn't have a textbook. <laughs> we have bundles, which means if you go into any one of these things, you will see that the most up-to-date information is shared. And so like, for example, a month ago, um, Sherman's article on, on how, um, how memories might be stored in, 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 um, in, in, in molecules and chemical processes, all the updated stuff is shared. And so the idea is to stay abreast of the new information. And for those of you who, the, the, what I just shared as far as the bundles are concerned, we update them every single year. And mm. the link that I just sent you is permanent. So you guys can just hang on to that link forever and we will update it and you don't even notice it because we just, we drop stuff and add stuff every single semester. And so that is how you stay up to date. You try to stay on top of the field. And when somebody asks us, for example, my students asked recently, can you create a bundle on, I mean, it, that chronobiology is absolutely fascinating and it's a new field. We didn't have a bundle on chronobiology, so I, I created one. So, and we will continue to curate that. So when new topics or new evidence comes up, we are able to keep it fresh in our bundles. So we don't marry ourselves to a textbook that goes out of date even before it comes in print. We actually rotate that. So the bundles have a lot of benefits. They, they let the students choose their homework. So there's a lot of autonomy in that. We keep things up to date. There's a lot of benefit in that. Great, thank you. That was helpful, Tracy. Before I move on to the next questions, I just want to ask if the bundle link that you shared is different than the one uh, that you shared with the QR code, because we also had, you also shared some resources for teachers. I think uh, it's the same as the QR code. If you click it, where okay. does it take you? Does it take you to something that says bundle collection? It should. It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there, it's the same. Okay. Yeah. Does this one have, yeah. And this one has the new chronobiology. Uh, so yeah, this is the updated. Yeah. This okay. is the new one. Yeah. Well, I'll go with Chloe's question first. So she asks, uh, I may have misunderstood, but you seem to be implying that it's relatively straightforward to translate what we know about how people learn to advising teachers how they should teach. But how straightforward is it really to make that translation? And uh, should a PE be, be, sorry? No, go ahead, finish. I'm yeah. sorry. And she says, 
should MBE be aiming for small incremental changes or a radical reimagining of teaching in our schools? That's a great question. I don't ever go small. I think it's really, um, I think we've, we have, uh, and Chloe, I think you should be proud. We have made some beautiful incremental and very, very well established um, advances over the past 15 years, it's been phenomenal. It's really, really wonderful. I do think that what we need to be able to do, I, I, what I was implying is that we have very few translational scientists, but we do also have very few conceptual understandings. I don't think that um, everything that Michael has written about, I agree with. I would hope that the things that I put in making classrooms better, 50 interventions that work in mind brain education science, he would also agree with. There, there's not a lot of difficulty at certain very high levels of understanding, which are like these principles that I was saying. There's very few people who would ever, ever dispute that these principles are not true. How do you turn the principles? How do you turn what we know about how the brain might learn? How do you move that into educational practice? That gets to that com complex slide I was trying to show you from the chapter on the book on the science of teaching is that, um, and if you would like, I don't know if I'm supposed to, but I will share the chapter with you if you write to me and want the chapter. In this book, the what I propose is there's a new taxonomy of how to think about where evidence comes from. And that, that includes not only the stuff that we get directly from neuroscience that has direct applicability to education, but that we look at all these other kinds. And so the chapter sort of explains all of these different ways that we could incorporate this information. But this also means it's bi-directional, right? It's not that we're just, we share with teachers, this is what works. What I love and I find the most effective is when I go to teachers, I ask them what works and then I tell them why. And when you tell them why it works, that, that gets into the neuroscience of it. And that's when they actually love, they really, okay, so this is confirmed, you know, this is, ah, so this is what's happening. This is why that rehearsal was so important for, for them to recall it the next day. This is why. So instead of people telling teachers what to do, I think you should, we should make a better job at doing this, uh, you know, very equitable exchange and conversation and ask the teachers what they know already works and then help them see why it works through this lens of mind-brain education science. Does that make sense? Thanks. Thank you, Chloe and Tracy. And uh, we have a question from Kim. She asks, how, Tracy, you see AI working to unite all the individual areas to inform instruction and possibly speed up the progress? I think that's a really great question, and it's and I've thought a lot, a lot, a lot about this over the past couple of months. Um, I like I'm going to tell you one big fear and one big hope. <laughs> my my biggest uh, fear, having just written this book about the neuroscience of writing, so writing, thinking, in the brain, of understanding how most of the product of writing is this invisible process of thinking that we are now able to identify all of these amazing sub elements that go into the thinking process that's behind the written product. And to celebrate that is, is huge because there's a mutual benefit. Better writers become better thinkers, better thinkers become better writers. There's a ton of evidence that shows that writing about what you're reading improves your understanding of the reading, but also improves your writing, but it also your general understanding of the information. And so, these things go hand in hand. Writing and thinking go hand in hand. When you care, like I do, about the process, the process of writing, the product actually becomes almost secondary. I care how to develop my students' way of thinking about approaching problems and doing research. Um, and that works at different speeds for different people because they have different life experiences and all the rest of that. But that process, a lot of them have to hit a wall and realize, oh my gosh, there's life after a five paragraph argumentative essay. I really should be looking at transdisciplinary research to come up with a creative research question. It's a different way of thinking. And that's a higher level of thinking that we're looking for. So 
that's a long introduction to say that if you only care about the product, use ChatGPT. It's much faster. But if you care about developing thinking processes, you may not skip. In my class, you can use ChatGPT as a sparring partner. You can use it to help you suss out different areas of your research project. You can use it to refine ideas, but you may never use it to write in my class because I don't want to skip those thinking steps. So that is my main concern about ChatGPT and AI. But looking at AI writ large, I see there's a huge positive benefit of being able to someday um, ask and say, what evidence is there from neuroscience, psychology, mental health and well-being, and education that X intervention is beneficial in teaching and learning? The only problem is right now, ChatGPT, at least from my experience, is inventing about 25% of the stuff it spits out at you. But if I ask, is there evidence, it'll say, oh yeah, and they'll spit out a bunch of stuff and you'll think, I hit the jackpot, and then you go and look and the sources are just made up. And so if it, we get beyond that, which may take longer than we think, because the more people who use it, the more junk goes in. And so the quality of their answers gets lower and lower with more people playing with it. But eventually there is a great way to accumulate information which is absolutely fabulous. And so I do say, I love technology, but I, and I think that technology should be leveraged so that humans can do what they do best. You know, I, no problem in having, you know, Canvas self-correct all the quizzes, no problem in doing that so that I have more time to meet one-on-one -on -one with my students and nurture them, motivate them, get them to understand their own thinking. I care about that part of it. And so I like technology for the way it helps me be more human. Um, I, I don't know if that was a convoluted answer, but I, I, I'm afraid of it, but I'm loving it. And so <laughs> it's kind of a mixed bag. And I think a lot of us have the same mixed feelings about AI right now. I can also agree with that. I mean, it's a useful tool, but it's also very dangerous right now in terms of finding evidence-based uh, resources. Yeah. Um, I think we can take another question. Uh, Dr. Wolf says, in the U.S., Teacher education has used universal design for learning as the foundational framework to remove barriers and to be more inclusive in the teaching methods. The question is, what are your thoughts about UDL and do you think that it does mind, brain, health and education justice? Oh, I love UDL. And I think that um, my, in fact, in, in our book on, on the, the writing, thinking in the brain, we actually have a whole chapter dedicated to how it can be leveraged. The problem is, as I mentioned before, you see all these things that are complex design studies, or am I not sharing my screen anymore? Did I stop sharing? Yeah, uh, we can see your screen now. Sorry. Yeah. Remember I talked about these complex design studies? Universal Design for Learning fits in that. It is absolutely brilliant when it's done well. And it's a disaster when it's not done well. So so the the good, the I think there's, to me, there's two basic parameters. UDL works when you're able to understand the range of your learners and the scope of your tools. And if you know that, and then you have a good sense of design, of instructional design, you can create an experience where everybody enters at their starting point and gets what they need because you've provided the resources to fill in that gap of prior knowledge. Um, and this works on this huge principle. Bloom said this back in 56 or 48 or whatever, he, or 68. He said, 90% of the people in our class can learn what we're trying to teach them if they just had enough time. But what was the time for? The time was for filling in prerequisite knowledge. A lot of people come to our class and we're ready to teach algebra, but they're missing something, right? Or if we're second grade, we're trying to teach subtraction. But if you have gaps, missing notions in addition, it's impossible. You have a very, you don't have the scaffolding on which to build that higher order knowledge, right? So the idea of UDL is, do I know the scope of my learners? Where's the lowest, lowest and the highest flyer? Okay, now what are all the tools I can incorporate here? Now, how is it that I can make sure that everybody enters at their starting point and gets what they need? If you can do that, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, I'd love to invite you. I have a video on our, our course design um, uh, in, in Harvard, we try very hard to do, to live up to many of the universal design for learning standards because we have non-credit, undergraduate and graduate students all in the exact same class. And I have to figure out how to differentiate for them. So one way is through the bundles where they choose their own homework. But another thing is that I get to know them better so that I know 
what gaps they might have so that we go filling in what those those people need. So UDL, I think it's great when it's done right. So I guess that's true for just about any intervention. Moving to another question from Mahitab. She asks, how do you think the methodological limitations in neuroscience research should be communicated to teachers, considering that this might undermine their confidence in what could be applied to the classroom? That's a great question. We just had a, our course that was on um, our, our week that was looking at neuroanatomy, and we had a great section with um, a former TA of mine who works at MIT in the learning lab, who did a section on neuroimaging or neuroimagining. And by the end of it, you had a bunch of deflated people saying, we're killing ourselves learning all this stuff about the brain and you're telling us all these limitations that this is not really true and there's only this many subjects in this and that this was hand colored by somebody and you know in a very objective way. And anyways, learning, I, I think that it's, I think that there's a lot of ways to frame this. We know more about the human brain than we ever have in the history of humanity right now. It's amazing. And we know so little. And that's where all these neural myths are parking up from is that people believe that they see one study doing X. So we try to teach instead of um, the big warnings about the methodological restraints, we also try to teach them just some good critical skills in basic research. And I'll put that into, I'll drag that file into, um, into your folder that the studies have to match you know your audience if you've got two studies on old rats that tell you something and then you're trying to prove something about <clears throat> young children totally not useful right you have to first make sure that you're matching your audiences that your your objectives are clear was it a study that was um, replicated all these other things we have this if then if then if then way to decide if information belongs or not uh, in neuroscience or in, sorry in mind brain education science I'll try I'll find that uh, infographic right now uh, hang on a second I'm going to stop this so that you don't have to look at all of my files but I will I will drag that in there because I do think it is very important to recognize the limitations but at the same time I think it's very uh, you can we I think that as people communicate these things you can't overstate how important it is to say this is why it's so brilliant if you look at most peer-reviewed articles, most of them end by humbly laying their, you know, to the ground saying, even though we found this really cool stuff, there's so much more that needs to be done in this, that, the other thing. And this is my limit. These are all my limitations. I judge a great paper by the person who knows how to, they know their own limitations. If they know, oh, this wasn't a very big study or this was just a lit review and there was no experimentation. If they're able to say that, then you think, okay, this person may be onto a very smart idea that still doesn't have enough evidence, but maybe it's worth considering. And so I think those kind of basic skills are very important to teach, basic research skills. If you like, we have a ton of, we have not a bundle, but we have a ton of um, videos on, on basic research skills that we, we try to teach. So. I'm going to find that uh, graphic right now. So, and we have a minute or two left, but we can have just another question uh, from Michael. So he asks, does the closure of the distinct Harvard MBA program indicate that its ideas have become more mainstream in education or that Harvard educators think MBA hasn't delivered? Oh, that was just such a tragedy. I think it's neither of those answers. Um, I actually think it has it had to do with a, a kind of a leadership decision. And when I really I wrote a twenty page letter in protest of all of that, very very bothered and angry about that to the dean, and she very short she wrote in a very quick reply that you know what we have thirty two master's programs right now. We this is so similar to this other one. This is so similar to this other one. If we don't consolidate, we will not survive as a program. And this is this is when all of education was going through crisis during COVID. Like, where, what are universities for anymore? And so basically, they made a decision, which to this day, I'm not sure if they are totally convinced that that was the way to go for it. Um, but I do think that they they saw what everybody saw from the very beginning. Having a field with three names, mind, brain, education, it didn't 
fly in anybody's ear very well. Everybody said, okay, let's go for educational neuroscience. What I do see is a huge trend in the other direction of learning sciences, like sort of going even one step, let's just be more macro than macro at this stage instead of um, specifying mind, brain, and education. So um, yeah, if you want to talk about that some more, let's have a drink because that made me very sad. <laughs> Tracy and everyone, thank you very much for, for the talk. And we had burning questions. I still have more questions, but we ran out of time. So uh, I think T Tracy has already shared her email. Uh, you can email her or you can email any anybody from the Center for Education Nurses and we can forward to Tracy. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I will put, also put this um, thing about research to ensure quality information and how, how, if then, if then, how to sort of do that. I'll put that in the folder that I shared with you. And um, if you were serious about making this field grow, about the appreciation for transdisciplinary thinking for problem solving, especially as it relates to better teaching, um, I am with you. And so if you count me as an ally, if you have questions and things, I pretty much always answer my emails. I'm a little slow sometimes, but, and if I don't reply in a week, write back, it's not obnoxious. I just need the reminder. Um, I do want to be on your side for that because I do think it's, you know, it's committed sardines. You know how sardines work? There's an inertia in education right now, but if one or two of you guys start going the other way, okay, all of a sudden we're going to have the inertia we need to actually make this big change. So looking forward to, to having you um, on board with that. Thank you very much. Superb. Thank you very much, everybody. And Tracy, thanks again. Uh, see you next week in our next CN seminar. Thank you for your organization. Really Bye -bye. appreciate it. Bye, Yasim. Bye. Bye.